This YouTube series will cover material that we cover in our Introduction to Astronomy class from a meteorite found in Antarctica from the planet Mars and the search for life, all the way through to supernovas and black holes. So, it falls to us now to build ourselves a solar system, and this happens around 4.6 billion years ago. The whole process that I'm going to describe takes anywhere from 10 to perhaps 100 million years, which is a short period of time in comparison to the age of the universe. And uh, it relies on one thing, and that is gravity. So please note that all I need to form a solar system, stars, planets, both terrestrial and Jovian, is gravity. We've got the raw ingredients. This is what I'll call our solar nebula. A nebula is a cloud of gas and dust. Our solar system will be born out of this cloud. It's got small clumps of material. Each of those clumps, like the cloud itself, is made up of 98% hydrogen and helium and 2% other, the 2% other coming from supernovas. And the giant cloud is rotating on its axis. So we've got big and small clumps of hydrogen and helium and 2% other mixed together. And like I said, gravity begins to do its work. Gravity begins to attract the small pieces together a little bit and the big pieces together even faster. So I'll draw more arrows into the big clumps and fewer arrows into the small. That is known as the process of accretion. The process of accretion is the gravitational gathering of material. Literally, it's just like dropping this pen to the floor or seeing a shooting star fall from the sky onto the earth. That's the process of accretion. It continues to this day. But it begins in the early solar system, 4.6 billion years ago, with big clumps growing faster than little ones. Sort of like a snowball effect. Have you ever built a snowman? You start with a small clump of snow and it takes forever to build a big one as you roll it along. You start with a good sized chunk and boy that thing grows fast. That's the same thing that's going on here. And as this process of accretion grows these big clumps bigger and bigger, faster and faster, you're condensing the material together. And as you condense a rotating body, what happens is is that that rotating body begins to spin faster and faster. What we described as the figure skater effect. The snowball effect causes the big things to grow faster, the little ones to grow slower, and then just like a figure skater pulling their arms in, they rotate faster. Yes, it's also known as the conservation of angular momentum. I'll call it the figure skater effect. It explains it just as well. So what happens here is this begins to spin faster and faster, and you take what started off as a spherical object, you spin it faster and faster as accretion takes place, and it flattens into a disk. The pizza dough effect. Just like at the pizza parlor, someone takes a bit of dough and spins it up in the air, it flattens into a disk. So our early solar system, our early solar nebula, has clumps surrounding other clumps. They have been accreted into some sort of disk as the result of the figure skater effect and the pizza dough effect. We find ourselves in a flattened disk of material. That's exactly why all the planets sit in the same plane. In fact, I'm going to start calling these things not clumps anymore, but protoplanets with the big object at the center being a protostar, the protosun. How many of these do we have to have? My, your guess is as good as mine. There might be 40 or 50 protoplanets, but what happens to them is they collide, and eventually the stable ones are the ones that survive. The ones in near circular orbits, somewhat elliptical orbits, but orbits that don't cross over each other. Could there be more than one star? Sure, why not? In fact, as we'll see later in the term, two star systems, 
binary star systems are more common than single star systems. In our system, one giant clump forming the proto-sun and eight, nine, ten, depending on how you mark it, proto-planets forming out of that disk as a result of many, many collisions. In fact, if we took a close look at one of these proto-planets, the proto-Earth, we would find that it is a large cloud of 98% hydrogen and helium and 2% other. But the 2% other doesn't sit mixed around. It sinks to the center because it's denser, it's heavy. And so the early Earth has a 2% other at the center. Hot. Why? Because we've got this process of accretion. Remember when things condense, they heat. So we've got the 2% other at the center, sunk down because it's denser, and the 98% hydrogen and helium floating up to the surface. We call that process of the heavy sinking to the center and the light floating to the surface. Hydrogen and helium here, the Earth's first atmosphere, if you will, and the 2% other at the center. We call that differentiation. So the process of accretion leads to the process of differentiation. The heavy stuff sinks to the center, and then something spectacular happens. This proto-sun ignites. It begins to glow. It produces heat, light, energy, and a stream of charged particles comes racing off the early sun. And that stream of charged particles creates what's called a solar wind. In fact, the solar wind continues even to this day. It is cause, as we'll discuss later, for the solar wind plowing into our magnetic field, channeling to the poles and creating the aurora borealis, the aurora australis, the northern and southern lights. But there is no magnetic field in the proto, this early Earth, so what happens is the solar wind strikes the first atmosphere of hydrogen and helium on the planets of Mercury and Venus and Earth and Mars, the planets that are smaller and closer to the sun, and strips off this first atmosphere, leaving behind a molten nugget of 2% other, what we call the terrestrial planets. And then as you move further from the sun, though they have differentiated, the planets Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune have all differentiated with that nugget, but the solar wind has no T. 5, 10, 15, 20 astronomical units from the Sun. And so those planets probably grow at the expense of the inner planets, but they certainly lose nothing else to the solar wind. And they find themselves building larger, gas-dominated Jovian planets. That distinction between terrestrial or Earth-like planets and Jovian planets will lead us to our next topic of discussion.